Excerpts from my translation of the Japanese linguistic landscape, Reflections on Quintessential Words, by Nakanishi Susume, published in 2019 by the Japan Library. As always, I'm going to read two, ex two um, entries. The first is Kogarashi. The second is Ikanobori. Kogarashi. Cold, late autumn winds. Kogarashi denotes cold, harsh, tree-withering winds. In haiku, kogarashi is a seasonal word, a kigo, that falls into the winter category. But the term refers to the chilling winds that start to blow around the late autumn and continue just until the start of winter. The cold winds and rain that straddle these two seasons, like the winds and rain that come during the shigure rainy season, have a kind of nebulous character that makes them hard to classify as either belonging to autumn or winter. They essentially bridge the transition from one season to the next in a slow, gradual pattern. The chill in the air grows colder each day, starting around the end of autumn. The sky grows thick with heavy clouds. In the morning, when you start wondering whether it might be time to start building, uh, bundling up in warmer clothes. When you awake, you notice the trees starting to turn yellow and red, their leaves numb from the cold. At this point, the wind known as the kogarashi, which is written ki, tree, and karashi, karashi, makes its appearance, blowing in with a cold gust, turning the trees bare and sparing not a single leaf. Of course, trees shed their leaves as a kind of defense mechanism that preserves the life of a tree. Technically, then, a tree losing its leaves is not actually withering away. To my mind, a beautiful word is one that gracefully bridges the gap between objective fact and subjective human impression. If kogarashi denotes a wind so brutal that it actually did cause the trees to die off completely, the word would evoke no lyrical impressions. The fact that the natural kogarashi phenomenon doesn't, does not kill the trees is what gives the word its poetic quality a dimension that makes Kogarashi a fitting name for literary characters. Take assassin Kogarashi Monjiro, for, ex for instance, the main character of Sazazawa's Saho's eponymous, eponymous novel, which Ichikawa made into a TV series in 1972-1973. By contrast, the decidedly unlyrical pine wood Nematode Matsukui Mushi, which actually does wither and kill pine trees, will always have a hard time finding its way into the names of fictional characters. I am also quite fond of the related word, kōraku, a combination of the Chinese characters for yellow and falling, kōraku, which describes the landscape that the kōgarashi winds leave in their wake. Trees' leaves f turn yellow and fall, the larger ones piling atop one another on the ground, forming a heap that makes a crackling sound the very sound of winter. A superb haiku about the kogarashi winds from the Edo period goes, Kogarashi no hate wa arikeri, umi no oto. Tree withering gust reaching its ultimate end, sound of the ocean, by Ikenishi Gonsei of the mid-Edo period. As the poem suggests, the writer hears the booming sound of the tide, the shionari, after the kogarashi winds sweep through, although the sound of the ocean he refers to is in fact Lake Biwa. The kogarashi winds enter the sea only to transform into the roaring tide. This grand circular movement, a kind of eternal return, is the very life force of nature. And here's the second one, ikanobori, a squid-shaped paper flying kite. Ikanobori and tako basically refer to the same thing, traditional fl Japanese flying kites. The history of the kite in Japan is quite long. The concept seems to have been imported from China as early as the 10th century, but it wasn't until the Edo period that it acquired the meaning it currently has today for Japanese people, the fish-shaped kites that we see swimming up there high in the sky, riding the wind. According to one theory, the objects are called tako, octopus, in the Kanto region, and Ika, or squid, in the Kansai and Hokuriku regions. 
We know that by the 10th century, Japanese people had already begun cutting paper in the shape of a tobi, or kite bird in English. And so, when the flying kite changed from airborne bird to a sea creature at some point, it became tako in the east and ika in the west. Both tako and ika got their names from imagining creatures with tails attached. From the standpoint of the formation of Japanese culture, the fact that, the, that East Japan and West Japan used different terms, tako and ika, for the same form of recreation is of great interest. The object used by Benjamin Franklin in his experiments was also a tako, which happens to be called kite, also taking its name from the kite bird in English. I grew up in the Kanto region, so I always called the kite by the name tako, or octopus. At some point, however, I encountered this other word, ikanobori, and immediately took to it. It wasn't so much that the ikanobori itself was anything special. Rather, it was that it made a notable appearance in the following magnificent haiku by Yosa Besson, the great mid-Edo poet, haikai poet. Ikanobori, kino no sora no aridokoro. Paper kite in the same place as it was in yesterday's sky. Here the poet is gazing up at a vacant sky. All he sees there is empty space, or what is called absolute emptiness, koku in Buddhism. And yet, in that empty sky, Busson can still make out the spectral vision of a kite that had been flying there just yesterday, an image that had seared itself into in his mind's eye. The kite stays there, fixed for all eternity, never making even the slightest flutter. The kite in Busson's haiku, then, stands for all things of this world that exist amid absolute emptiness, koku, that leave remnant traces even after they have vanished. It is this symbolic resonance that pervades the term tako that moves us so deeply. There is a more recent poem called Tako by Nakamura Minori, Minori, a poet born in 1927, and the beautiful verse describes the kite in a similar way. Though the kite appears to be perfectly skill, still, Nakamura writes, it flutters continuously in the wind. I suppose Yosa Buson, too, saw the same deceptive stillness that Nakamura's kite evo evokes, an analog for our own moving yet somehow static lives. Ever since I encountered these two poems, Ikanobori has become a truly magical word to me.